Here I've got a nice problem that appeared on the 1999 Asian Pacific Math Olympiad. And what I like about this is that it looks like a straightforward number theory problem, and I think you can approach it like that, but the way that we will approach it involves polynomials, and there's nothing about polynomials in this statement. Okay, so let's see what it says. We wanna determine all A and B, which are integers, such that a squared plus 4b and b squared plus 4a are perfect squares. And I'm just going to say that we're going to focus on the values that are not easy. Notice that if a is 0, b is equal to m squared, that gives us an easy solution. And furthermore, if b is 0, then a is equal to m squared. That's another easy solution. So here are two infinite families of solutions. So now that we've looked at those, we're going to look at maybe the less trivial cases, and that's when a and b are both non-zero. So they're non-zero, but one of them might be larger than or equal to the other. And so without loss of generality, we're going to assume that the absolute value of b is less than or equal to the absolute value of a. And then whatever we, solution we get out of this assumption, we'll have a symmetric solution where we switch A and B. And now from here, I'll notice that these two expressions really look like the discriminant inside the quadratic formula. So let's consider two quadratic equations that would be built off of these discriminants. So we've got x squared and then plus ax minus b equals zero and x squared plus bx minus a equals zero. So we're gonna consider both of those. Notice this has solutions given by x equals negative a plus or minus the square root of a squared plus four b all over two. And then this one over here has solutions x equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared plus four a over two. And then from here, we'll notice that our assumptions mean that these parts involving square roots are integers. So we've got that as an integer, and this right here is also an integer. Again, that's because our assumption is that this and this are perfect squares, and then under that assumption, we need to figure out what A and B are. Okay. But now looking at this, we see that 4B is most definitely even. And so the parity of this thing inside of the orange box is the same thing as the parity of A. What I mean by parity is the evenness or oddness. But that means when we have A plus something with the same parity as A, we'll have an even number, which means this entire thing is actually an integer. And then we can make the same argument over here to see that this whole thing is also an integer. So what that tells us is that these two polynomials in fact have integer roots. Great. Now they may have a single root if this thing in here is zero, but notice this thing in here cannot be zero with our setup. So they have exactly two integer roots. So that's good to know. Okay, so now keeping that in mind, we'll focus on this first polynomial, which I'll just bring down here. We have x squared plus ax minus b has integer roots from our previous observation, but it also can factor via those roots. So we've got this factors like x minus alpha times x minus beta, where just to like reiterate this fact that I've said a few times, alpha and beta are integers. Now we can multiply this back out, and then we'll have x squared minus the quantity alpha plus beta times x plus alpha times beta. But that really helps us out quite a bit because we can equate coefficients on either side of this equation. So here we have a is the same thing as negative alpha plus beta. And then negative b is the same thing as alpha times beta.
So let's write that out down here. So we have alpha plus beta equals negative a. So I've just switched that around a little bit. And then we have alpha times beta equals negative b. So I'll put that in an orange box, but we'll eventually bring it up to the top of the board because this is pretty important. Now I'm gonna do one more trick involving the roots of this polynomial and an inequality, which will reduce the possibilities that these roots can take. So I'll first notice that one is most definitely less than or equal to the absolute value of a over b. So that's by our assumption up here that the absolute value of a is bigger than or equal to the absolute value of b. But then let's notice that this is equal to the absolute value of alpha plus beta over alpha times beta. And that's by these equations over here. I've just replaced b with alpha times beta, really negative alpha times beta. And I've replaced a with alpha plus beta. But notice the minus signs disappear because I took an absolute value. But if we look at this closely, we can separate this fraction into two fractions that are just reciprocals of integers. This is the absolute value of one over alpha plus one over beta. Okay, but now we can use the triangle inequality to see that this is less than or equal to the absolute value of one over alpha plus the absolute value of one over beta. Okay, nice. So let's see what we have. We have one is less than or equal to the absolute value of the reciprocal of two integers. But the only way to add the reciprocal of two integers and get something that is bigger than or equal to one is for one of those integers to be less than or equal to two. Really, I mean the absolute value is less than or equal to two. Notice if the absolute value of both of them were bigger than or equal to three, then each of these would be less than or equal to a third, but you add things up that are less than or equal to a third and you get something that is less than or equal to two thirds, so that doesn't get bigger than one. Okay, so let's just maybe summarize that fact over here. We have the absolute value of alpha is less than or equal to two or the absolute value of beta is less than or equal to two. Really it's one or the other, or maybe both. But notice that we haven't like strictly named alpha and beta, so we'll just pick alpha to be the one that is less than or equal to two in absolute value. But that tells us that alpha comes from the set negative two, negative one, one, or two. Okay, great. So there are two important pieces of information on the board. There's this one in orange, and there's also this one over here in red. And those two pieces of information can be fused together to take us to the end. But we've got to do this in a couple of cases, and those cases are from these choices for alpha. So let's maybe get rid of this, and then we'll move on to the next step. So on the last board, we got down to the following two important pieces of information we have that alpha plus beta is negative a, alpha times beta is negative b, and then alpha comes from the set negative two, negative one, one, and two. And again, we're still working under the assumption that these two objects over here are perfect squares. Okay, so we're gonna look at this one case at a time, and we'll in fact just look at two cases, and I'll leave two cases as kind of homework exercises. So let's first look at the case when alpha is equal to two. So here I'll underline that in yellow to show that we're looking at the case when alpha is equal to two. Okay, well plugged into this up here, that tells us that beta plus two is equal to minus a, and two times beta is equal to minus b. But now we can reduce beta out of this system of equations and then we can relate A with B. So let's see what we get if we do that. So I'm gonna take this whole thing and multiply it by two. Maybe we'll multiply it by negative two. So what is that gonna give us? That's gonna give us negative two beta minus four is equal to two A. And then down here we'll have two beta is equal to negative B. Now we can add those two equations and that'll leave us with 2a minus b is equal to negative 4. 
but we can easily solve that for b, and that'll give us b is equal to 2a plus 4. So we've got this nice relationship between a and b in this case. And from here, we want to use the fact that these two objects are perfect squares along with this relationship with a and b to zero in on the possibilities for a and b. Okay, so let's do that. Let's first look at the case where we're looking at a squared plus 4b. So if we plug that in here, we'll have a squared plus, well, 4b will be 4 times 2a, that is 8a plus 4 times 4 is 16. Notice that easily factors as a plus 4 quantity squared. So this is always a perfect square in this case. So this is always satisfied for all a and b satisfying this linear relationship. Well, that's actually not extremely helpful because we would like something that really got us down to just a few values of a and b, but hopefully the next one will. In other words, this rule right here where b squared plus 4a must be a perfect square. So let's look at that. So we've got b squared plus 4a needs to be a perfect square. I'll call that m squared. But that's going to be the same thing as 2a plus 4 squared plus 4a equals m squared. I just replaced b with this thing over here. But now multiplying this out will give us 4a squared plus 20a plus 16 equals m squared. So that 20 came from 16a from this product and then 4a from the leftover bit. But now this may seem a little bit tricky to deal with, but what we'll do is complete the square with some of the parts on the left hand side. You might say, well, I already had a perfect square in the step above, but I had this 4a on the outside. And I would like my perfect square to gobble up all of the parts having to do with a. So I can do that by noticing that 16 is most definitely equal to 25 minus nine. Then if we group the 25 with these two terms, I've got a nice factorization. That gives me 2a plus 5 quantity squared minus 9 is equal to m squared. And now we're going to use this fact which I think is fair game and it has to do the difference between perfect squares. So we know that consecutive perfect squares differ by odd numbers and thus non-consecutive perfect squares differ by sums of consecutive odd numbers. So just to like spell that out, this 2a plus 5 could be equal to 25, then 25 minus 9 is equal to 16. So that's one possibility for this equation to be solved. And another possibility would be this 2a plus 5 squared equals 9, and then this thing equals 0. So I'll let you guys show that this is not possible when we have 25 and 16. That doesn't give us a nice solution. So we'll move on to this other case. So we have 2a plus 5 squared is equal to 9, which means that 2a plus 5 equals 3, or 2a plus 5 equals minus 3 by taking the square root. Okay, so if 2a plus 5 equals 3, then that means 2a equals negative 2, a equals negative 1. But now if a equals negative 1, then b equals 2. And that's by this relationship right here. But now if b is equal to 2 and a is equal to negative 1, then our original inequality is not satisfied. So this is in fact not possible. So let's look at what we get for the other part. So here we get 2a is equal to negative 8, which means a is equal to negative 4. Plugging that in here, we'll see that b is also equal to negative 4, and that's okay. And so that gives us our first new solution. a is equal to negative 4, and b is also equal to negative 4. Okay, so let's get rid of this calculation and we'll move on to another case. So we just got done looking at the first case, which was when alpha was equal to two, and we got a solution, a and b are both negative four. 
Notice since A is equal to B, we don't get another symmetric solution. We only get one solution here because switching in A and B give us the same solution. Okay, now we'll look at the second case, and this will be the last case that we prove in the video. I'll leave this alpha equals minus two and alpha equals one case for like homework exercise. Okay, so we're looking at alpha equals minus one. So what does that tell us about A and B from this? This tells us that beta minus one is equal to minus A, and then minus beta is equal to minus B. Okay, but now notice that this tells us that beta is equal to B. And then over here, we've got A is equal to one minus beta, which is one minus B. So we've got this relationship right here, A is equal to one minus B. But that's symmetric with B is equal to one minus A. So we'll keep that in mind as well. So there's our relationship between A and B. Okay, but now we'll plug that relationship into each of these and see what it takes to make those perfect squares. So we'll take A squared plus four B. Notice that's gonna be A squared plus four times one minus A. Using that blue boxed expression for B in terms of A, but that gives us a squared minus four a uh, plus four, but that's equal to a minus two squared. That's always a perfect square for all values of a. Now we move on to the next one. So that's b squared plus four a. So that's gonna give us b squared plus four times one minus b using that red boxed relationship but that's gonna give us b squared minus four b plus four. So that's b minus two quantity squared. Again, always a perfect square. So that gives us a parametrized system of solutions. So we could take a to be a free variable, maybe we would call that free variable t, and then b would be one minus t. Or vice versa, we could take b to be our free variable t, and then a is one minus t. But actually those are the same, kind of given that these are inverses of each other. As t runs through all integers here, one minus t also runs through all integers. And those ordered pairs correspond to exactly the ordered pairs that are created over here. So maybe let's write this over here. We've got a new set of solutions given by t comma one minus t. Okay, so like I said, let's leave these last two cases for homework and maybe post in the comments what you get for those two remaining cases. And that's a good place to stop.